So welcome to today's talk. Uh, I, uh, I gave a talk a, about a month ago, and I was speaking about this fasting that I was doing. It started July 1st, and, you know, I just, I entered into this fast thinking, you know, wow, I can't wait to what, see what wonderful things appear on my birthday, July 31st, because that was what I was going to, um, when I was going to stop the fast. And uh, this fast included uh, no social media, news, television. I had clean eating, lots of physical exercise, lots of uh, daily spiritual exercises as well. So the beauty was that I could handle a bit more stress than uh, what I normally could handle. And so pastoral care became easier, uh, praying for others and stuff like that. Just my daily assignments became a joy. I noticed that I woke up joy-filled. I was excited to start the day. Wow. And I had so much energy. I didn't have to take a daytime nap. Believe me, I, I felt right before I started the fast that uh, I was, you know, entering into my 80s. And so being at home all the time just wasn't doing me too good. So that was the beauty of it. Now, the beast part of it. So around the time that Hurricane Douglas was about to hit, I was just going to peek and see where Hurricane Douglas was. And in all that peeking and everything else, there were ads that popped up of COVID cases and, you know, just things that kind of inundated me. And I noticed that I began to feel this sense of worry again and this sense of fear. For some reason, something was happening. I had been joy-filled up for, what, 24 days or so. And then suddenly I was not so happy and I started to become a bit ill, not COVID ill, but just things, the body started breaking down a bit. And by midweek, I received news that one of my big investments had tanked, and a dear friend of mine would be moving off of island suddenly. And then there were some other things happening as well. I wasn't hearing from my son. He was on deployment. Just a, a plethora of things showed up in my experience. And I started to look at what had gone wrong. So by the time my birthday, July 31st, had hit, things had kind of fallen apart. And uh, people at my party would never have known it, but I wasn't feeling too well. And I just wanted to go crawl into a cave and just sleep and not entertain anything. But I had already made a commitment. Uh, but before the fast, I said, you know, I saw the news before. What? you know, what's the difference now? Why suddenly, and I was attributing something to an outside force, an outside of the news media and, and stuff like that, like it just impre uh, impressed my subconscious mind. And then I was, I was almost self-righteous at this point. I was telling myself, I lived a great life. I was doing what was right. Uh, no cares or concerns with the outer world for the most part. Why is this happening? Why me? Woe is me. And then boom, I realized I was living the book of Job. Now, uh, for those that are not familiar with the book of Job, it's part of the wisdom literature in the Bible, and it's written as a dramatic poem. Unity uh, author Elizabeth Sand Turner calls this particular book in the Bible a masterpiece with its lofty theme, superb language, and she considered it to have a vital spiritual message for everyone on the path of spiritual enlightenment. And so that just means all of us, that when we read the book of Job, we'll find a special meaning and message in there for us. And the book of Job actually begs this question, why do the righteous suffer? And by righteous, I mean these questions of uh, why do good things happen or excuse me, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why do the good die young? And, you know, just these questions of the ages. And unfortunately, there are some things that the book of Job doesn't answer. And the book just really helps the reader to ultimately discern between self-righteousness and spiritual righteousness and to continue to hold fast to the many promises of God. And that's what the book of Job really does. And as with any book, there's always this plot and some characters that are playing some main roles in it. 
And each one plays their role perfectly, and I'll get to them in a moment. But we are all metaphysicians here, and so we're not looking at the surface. We want to dig and dive in deeper to it and give a metaphysical approach to this so we can discern what the hidden meaning or the meaning that maybe is not so apparent in the, uh, the forefront of it, what is there for us to know? And Job was a godly man seeking answers to suffering, to his own personal suffering. He had great wealth, a great household, a wife, seven sons, three daughters, servants, livestock. He was living the good life. One would even say that Job was, you know, a philanthropist in some regard. Uh, he always seemed to be helping out. And that's where, when he started suffering, he began to question his relationship with God. And it's a bit interesting, as Unity Minister Ed Rabel points out, that we have to remember that to many people, the book of Job is quite terrifying. It has all of these unanswered questions, and it makes some troubling accusations about God, and then ultimately about this character known as Satan. And it, it really troubles people, especially the idealistic religious people, as to Job seemingly just a very good man, suddenly there is a, a downfall of things happening. So it is one of those books that we don't have a lot of answers to, but like I said, when we get the metaphysical interpretation of it, it starts to make sense for us. And the reason why I like these books in the Bible, and Job is in the Old Testament, is because it's alive. There's every story, everything that could ever happen in your life. Like I, within a week, just things were happening left and right, and I felt inundated by, by just misfortune. And that's why instantly my mind went to Job. Like there's something for me in that book. So in one day, Job loses almost everything. His large herd of livestock, his servants, his home was blown over. His, all his children, all 10 of them, were in there, and they were killed. The only person to survive were Job and his wife. And he fell to the ground after he had shaved his head. And what he didn't start doing is he didn't start cursing God's name. What he did instead was say, Jehovah has given and Jehovah has taken away. Blessed be the name of Jehovah or our God or the Lord, as you would like to know it as. And behind the scenes, what was happening is, and this is where a lot of people have some trouble with this story, but uh, one day Satan, the troublemaker, comes to God and says, you know, I believe I can get some of your greatest people to turn against you. God's like, you know what, I know this guy named Lot, or not Lot, excuse me, Job. <laughs> and yeah, I'm getting these, just Lot and Job confused. I know this great guy named Job. I know that he upholds my name every time. You know what, I'm going to let you do what you will with him, and uh, we'll see what happens. God, very confident that no matter what happened, Job would be okay with that. So everything was taken away, minus his wife and his life. And God was very pleased that Job had said, yes, God, I still praise you. I still honor you. But then Satan said, you know what? It's easy for somebody to do that because it doesn't actually afflict them. Even though to me, if somebody took away all of that, it would feel very personal. And so God said, you know, go ahead, do something else. And so Satan went and he made the body of Job turn up with blisters from head to toe. Now, I don't know about you. Life is a lot easier, like no matter what's happening in the world, if my health is okay, then there's some part of me that's okay. And you know, there's a saying what people say, well, at least you got your health. It's very true because you can withstand a lot more when the body responds in a better way or when it has the strength to carry on. So the second wave hit Job. And at this point in time, his wife was furious, saying, I'd rather you die if you don't you know, beseech God and if you don't 
you know, basically curse his name, then, you know, we're done. And Job just would not do it. And during this time, he had four friends that came to, to visit him as well. Now, these characters can metaphysically represent maybe some friends and family of ours. If we're look, well, first of all, just the physical part can represent friends, family, news, whatever, things outside of us, per se, that are telling us that things are going wrong. Uh, uh, but really, when we look at it at a metaphysical stand, we see that even our thoughts can attack us. And so we're going to look at each one of these characters as thoughts that we may have that keep us from communing with the Most High, especially during uh, difficult times. So Job's friends come to counsel him. Job's, you know, curled up in a ball. He's got boils all up and down his body. His wife's upset with him. His family's gone. You know, it's a pretty, pretty rough time for this man. And they come to visit him. And the first one to speak is Eliphaz. He's the oldest friend of Job and reminds him of all the good deeds, all the good deeds that Job had done. And he should not let this misfortune overtake him. And he suggests that this has happened because of the result of some sin, stating that he has seen this type of dis, uh, disaster before, and it is because somehow Job has plowed some inequity and has made something, and, and well, right now he's reaping basically what he has sowed. And, you know, in this book, it also goes and tries to tie sin and error together with disaster and calamity. But the New Testament, we find the disciples, when they were suggesting the same thing to Jesus when it came to the blind man, Jesus actually said to them to... Um, he explained that man's suffering, things that happen in this world, cannot be explained by such neat or clear-cut theory at times. There's so much more that can go into it. So it may not be just this sin or error that has gotten you to this place. Not to discount it, but just know that there is a whole slew of other things working in one's life to produce certain results. And in New Thought Community, uh, because, you know, our thoughts attacking us or maybe sometimes people thinking that they're being helpful to us, uh, Job was really needing some clarity and some instruction. And his friend Eliphaz was really just telling him that, you know, he did wrong. There was something wrong. He needed to fix it and wasn't providing much comfort. And in New Thought Community, we can look at that as metaphysical malpractice where we're trying to be helpful, in this, you know, to people, but... Unfortunately, it is not taken that way. And really, I think what that actually means is that sometimes you do need a, a dose, a shot uh, in the behind, let's say some pure medicine to get you going and get you well again instead of little tablets here and there sugar-coated. And uh, Joe was looking for some sugar-coated stuff, some medicine, elixir, and his friends were not providing it. And next to speak was uh, Bildad. He suggested that God always acts with justice and fairness. Imagine your mind, things are happening, and these thoughts telling you that, you know what, it's something that you did. There's something wrong with you, or maybe even they did out there, or what have you. And so we're seeing that each one of these friends is representing some thought in our minds that happened whenever something doesn't go our way. And Bildad it was actually saying that, uh, that God was punishing him for other reasons. And Job counters the claim that God is punishing an innocent man. He got into his self-righteousness. So this is the key theme, the self-righteousness. He started giving reasons why he didn't deserve this, why these things had fallen to a man that had only done good in life. And Bildad was not too... Uh, pleasant with him either. So Job laments his condition and wishes that he was never born. And at times I know personally, especially in the past, things have happened in my life and I just want to throw myself a pity party. And my thoughts support me in that, believe me. <laughs> yes. 
And up to bat now we have Zophar, and he criticizes Job for challenging God's justice and claims that Job is being pushed or punished, excuse me, for his wickedness. Job agrees that the wicked are ultimately punished, but insists that they often prosper and flourish in this lifetime. And then something uh, of a round robin starts to occur. So Job is really standing on his thing that I did nothing. Uh, I'm an innocent victim at this point. Woe is me. And his friends take turns. Three rounds, uh, they went, all went, just kind of bashing him, just telling him how he was no good, how he had fallen short of the path of God, and how this is why he is being punished. And when we look at our own thoughts, maybe even our friends and family, they may we may be surrounded by people that love to give advice, who believe that they have the highest vantage point of something, uh, but really are at the same level as you. And you can never solve a problem at the level that created it. This is, we learn this all the time, that we have to rise above. And so this is what Job was trying to do, but he just couldn't get there. And now comes Elihu. And so this is the individual. He had kind of been sitting back watching uh, Job get kind of pounded by these individuals with words that were not too kind, even though they were trying to be helpful, as our friends often are, as our family often are, but just wasn't happening. And so he suggests that Job turn his mind to the Most High to the God Almighty, instead of focusing, instead of being self-righteous of what he did not do or what he did, focus your mind entirely upon God. Now, I am just making this a very brief description, but if you go into it, this is such a poetic book. It has such a profound lesson in it. It leaves the reader to question just life itself, but then ultimately you realize that what his friend Elihu was trying to do was to get him back to God. And during this time when his friends were in the round robin, just kind of going to tell him how good he's not, uh, he still stuck with God, but he still tried to defend his position. And in the end, what he was able to do and what God ultimately saw and was able to speak to was that Job stuck by and started to lift and realize, changed his mind instead of being self-righteous to being spiritually righteous. And that whenever something of a calamity happens in life, to focus that energy and all that attention, to be in the presence. Job wanted to ask God, why did this happen? But he didn't go directly to God. He had his friends surrounding him, telling him until one of them spoke to it. And God's response was a little bit arrogant. This is another thing that many people don't like about this book, but it just cuts through the chase, or cuts to the chase. And it really tells that, you know, I've heard, I witness, I'm very pleased at you for just keeping with me on this. And ultimately, Satan loses the, uh, yeah, Satan loses the, the bet because not once did Job denounced God, um, and he actually got back his double portion. So everything that was taken from him, he got a double portion of that. In a weird way, it worked itself out. I mean, I couldn't replace my own kids with, you know, 20 other and, you know, be too happy about it, but Job was delighted, and that's the, the happy news of this book. So after reading it, I went through some old spiritual exercises that I had not uh, put into use during the July month. And I came across one that is especially helpful, and I started to uh, put it to use. And it's called Ministering to God. And it really has its basis in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 through 21. And so it says, Awaken thou that sleepest. And it says, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. There's this great physician within you. 
just on standby, waiting to be employed. But we have to awaken it, especially if it's been asleep, especially if we've been entertaining thoughts and other things that are not so helpful. And it says in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So this is how we minister to God. We minister to that divine within and awaken it, reminding it of that presence and that goodness that God is in our lives that just operates through, in, and as us. And that it's necessary sometimes to use scripture and to use song to do that. And then ultimately, giving thanks is a way that this presence shows up because a grateful heart is able to receive a lot more and able to dissolve a lot more than a closed-off heart. And so what I'd like for you to do now, we want to go through just a quick practical exercise. So get your Bibles out. And if you don't have your Bibles, I do have this practical exercise from Psalm 46, King James Version. And I've changed the words a bit because this is what ministering to God does. It, you change the words to really speak to that presence within. And so we're going to start with the first verse of Psalm 46. And what you would do is just get into that meditative experience. Open up the Bible verse or whatever that really inspires you. And you start preaching to yourself. You need a good word sometimes. That God within, you know, is being activated the moment that you give it recognition. And this is what we're doing with it. And so it says, God, you are my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And when you can feel that, when you can know that you're speaking to that presence within you, and then it says, therefore, I will not fear, though the earth may be removed and through the, mount, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled through the mountain shake and the swelling, like no matter what is happening in our lives, Salah, we proclaim you, that divine essence, that divine spirit within to be in charge, to be in control. You have given us over 700 promises in the Bible and not one of them will fall through. We put our trust, our faith into you. And when you can speak to those things in these scriptures, that is that ministering. And I'm going to actually not do the rest of the slideshow, Thomas, just because we are running a little bit short on time. But this is what the call is. Sometimes you just have to motivate yourself. The world may not be able to do it. Even our friends and our family, they may have the best intentions. And they may be at the level of the problem as well. And so we're called to rise, to rise, and to rise to that mountaintop, to the highest level, to the high ground, where we can have a vantage point, looking down at our problems, realizing that our God is so much bigger than that, and giving praise and thanks for it, is the last part of this ministering. And so we can minister to God through scripture or through some great affirmations that we can customize ourselves. And we can minister through song. We can minister that joy. We can minister that peace. We can administer or minister to that God within that we know that that vibrational frequency of song just resonates and something happens, something clicks quicker than anything else out there. And so I invite you to this time where we sing a song, a healing song for ourselves, for our world. Joy fills every cell in my body. Every cell is alive with love. I relax into the healing process. I allow spirit to do what it does. Joy fills every cell in my body. Every cell is alive with love. I relax into the healing process. I allow spirit to do what it does. Peace fills every cell in my 
body, every cell is alive with love. I relax into the healing process. I allow spirit to do what it does. God fills every cell in my body, every cell is alive with love. I relax into the healing process. I allow spirit to do what it does. I allow spirit to do what it does. And when we take that and we can just find a song that lifts us, that infuses us with those promises, we'll see a transformation because this physician is within. Jesus said, physician, heal thyself. And that is our call. And we give thanks for that. And what I found is when I did this ministering to God, I finally heard from my son. He was back in the States from a long deployment that all the money that I had thought I lost in that initial investment came back to me in full and that these relationship things that I was having were completely dissolved. That there was peace when I started ministering. That things in the outer started to transform because I was transforming within. And so take that. Take and know the physician within you, that God presence. Physician, heal thyself. And so it is. Amen.